Yes, the hadith number is 6442. Okay, so this is in Bukhari, four places. And you can understand that based on this particular hadith, Imam Bukhari has generally summarized four main issues about this hadith. Okay? So, then why it is used in the book of tricks, you will understand from the point which I will explain to you when we will do the sharak of this hadith. So, it is clearly understood when we see that this book, this hadith is found in Kitab al Iman because all the five pillars of Islam and namaz and fasting, other things, they are part of our Iman because we know Iman is not with the air, mouth, uttering with the mouth, also it is part of the actions. So, salat is part of Iman. When we talk about fasting, yes, the, because Prophet Sassam did mention in the answer about the fasting. So Imam Bukhari definitely has used this hadith in the book of fasting. When we see about the witnesses, why this hadith has been used as in the witnesses is that Rasulullah Sassam, he, he is the witness for the man to go to Jannah and all the Sahaba were witnesses for this man to go to Jannah. And Prophet ﷺ met Allah as a witness and said that if he is speaking the truth, then he is a man who will go to Jannah. So, and this hadith, inshallah, I'll explain more. Just remind me about witnesses because it will go out of my head. I'll tell you why it is so important. And people, they think that Imam Bukhari, this some of the Hanafi scholars, they just criticize Imam Bukhari, saying Imam Bukhari was a man only memorizing the hadith like a parrot. He doesn't understand the fiqh. But I'll explain to you how this hadith is so important in the fiqh book of witnesses. And the tricks. What is the tricks in that? What is the heel in that? In Arabic, when we talk about kitab al heel it means looking for excuses. Okay, that's the meaning actually. Looking for excuses. You don't want to do something, so you put different types of questions. You question, the theme of the question is same, but you're coming in different, you know, ways, so that you get answer what you want. Okay, so this is where we will be learning. So all this, this is the four places Imam Bukhari has used this one hadith. Also this hadith is found in Kitab, uh, in Sahih Muslim, in the book of Iman. And the number of hadith is 12, by the same Sahabi. Also Imam Nasai Rahmatullah in his Sunan al Nasai collected this hadith in three different places. In the book of prayer, I repeat again, Imam al Nasai Rahmatullah in his Sunan, a Sunan al Nasai collected this hadith in the book of Salah, hadith number 454. In the book of fasting, hadith number 2063. In the book of faith and its laws, hadith number 4942. Sorry, in which the last book was? Faith and its laws. Faith and its laws. Anu. I don't know, my accent may not be clear to you, but it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hadith number is uh, 4,942. Uh, why you are getting a call? 4,942. So again you will understand, Imam Nasai Rahmatullah in Kitab salah because he speaks about the Salah. In Kitab fasting Siyam because it, he speaks about the fasting in the hadith. And also in Kitab Iman, because the part of our Iman and the rules and regulations and the laws of Iman is that action is there with the Iman, not without the action. So Imam Nasir Akhtarale has quoted this hadith in three different places in the same book. This hadith is also found in Sunan Abu Dawood. In Sunan Abu Dawood, Imam Abu Dawood Akhtarale has quoted this hadith in Sunan Abu Dawood. In the book of prayer, Hadith number is 
And Imam Abu Dawood has quoted this hadith in a different place in the same book, in the book of Oath and Vows. Qasr Nadar. In the book of Oath and Vows. Who was the first book for me? The first book is Kitabul Salat, the book of prayer. And the hadith number is 331. And the other, other hadith, uh, other book in the same Sunan Abu Dawood in Kitabul Nadar. Wal Ayman. Kitabul Nadar Wal Ayman. And the hadith number is 2830. Three zero. Also, this hadith is collected by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his Musnad, Musnad Abu Talha, because this hadith is reported by Talha bin Ubaidillah. So, in the in the Musnad of Talha bin Ubaidillah, in the part one, which is Jews one, and the page number is 162 in Musnad Imam Ahmad. This hadith is also collected in. Mawta Imam Malik. See, Imam Malik in his Mawta he has collected this hadith. And the book in which he collected is called Shortening of the Prayers. Qasrul Salah. Shortening of the Prayers while you are traveling. The whole name of the book itself is called Shortening the Prayers while traveling. And the hadith number is 382. Imam Ad-Darmi, in his book Sunan Ad-Darmi, Imam Ad-Darmi, compiled this hadith in his book Sunan Ad-Darmi, in the book of prayer. And the hadith number is 1532. So it is found in Bukhari, it is found in Muslim, it is found in Sunan Nasai, it is found in Sunan Abu Dawood. It is found in Musnad Imam Ahmad, it is found in Mawta Imam Malik, it is also found in Sunan al-Darmi. Seven classical books, mashallah. Sunan, Sunan Imam al-Darmi. Al uh, hadith number? Hadith number 1532. So see, every hadith that you are studying with me, it will be sufficient for every one of you to give one lecture on one hadith. So this information which you are getting, mashallah, you can yourself have a halakha and give one lecture on one hadith. Mashallah. Now we understand the points from the hadith. Pay attention to the hadith. A man from Najd with unkempt hair came to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Okay, here we get a different etiquette of a student. In the previous hadith we know that uh, Jibreel came in a very decent manner with, you know, tidy and neat and clean dress. And here this hadith says that the Sahabi who came to learn the deen Actually, this man was not a social type of man like in a civilized area. So he came from a countryside. So you can expect that kind of thing. Okay? But still, here we get a point that the student came to the teacher to learn the deen. Okay? Again. And he was so much devoted to learning of the religion that he was not more concerned about his appearance. This is what the scholars have said. Like if you, because I have been on TV since eight years now, every time I go, I see that there are people who when they want to come on TV, they do lots of makeup, powder, this and their hairstyle, and all those kind of things. SubhanAllah, because they are appearing on television. So, some part of the sincerity is gone. But this shows that the students of knowledge, mashallah, they don't, they have no more, you know, uh, interest in their appearance. Okay? 
and they don't care for it. They all what they care is to learn the deen, something that could help them in this dunya, so that this uh, knowledge of dunya can take them to the jannah. So this is alhamdulillah. But still, if you are not married yet, don't keep make yourself you know fussy boys. Make yourself handsome and attractive so that after the marriage, okay, no problem. Yes. After two, three children, then it's all right. But before the marriage, you should be attractive. At least to your wives. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So, the second etiquette of the student of knowledge is that sometimes, because of, you know, you don't get proper education, you may not learn the etiquette of addressing the teacher. Like I can tell you myself, when I first came to Islam, my upbringing as, was not like a civilized boy. So when I first attended my Sheikh Saab's lecture, I was sitting in like 50, 60 students away, because it was a big halqa, halqa. But my voice was so loud that if I had any issue with the Sheikh, I would just sit from the back and I'd raise my voice and even that, from that distance, my sheikh would think that I'm rude to him. <laughs> my sheikh would think that I'm rude to him the way I used to put the question. So after, in one of the occasions, he saw that I'm not learning whether it is right or wrong. So he didn't tell me in the public. He didn't say anything to me in the public. Once the lecture was finished, the halakha was done and I was leaving. He asked me to sit next to him. I sat next to him and then he taught me. Look, you shouldn't be asking the questions in this style and that style. That's all in the street, not in the study circle. You should be nice and you should be soft and you should be, you know, addressing Sheikh with this kind of attitude and all. So Alhamdulillah, but here we can understand the Sahabi, when he came to learn the deen, from the position where he first started to come close to Rasulullah, he was shouting and talking and murmuring something. And Sahaba didn't understand that, well, what is he saying? So, if you get some kind of characters like that in your gathering, you have to have patience. Okay, you have to tolerate them. Because look, Sahaba didn't say anything to this man. And then when he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Shaykh Sahab, I'm 35 years old man now, I don't have the wife. Please, can you resolve my problem? Oh, Sheikh Sahib, I'm not getting a job, you know, I applied here, I applied there, and every time when I'm applying, I'm not, you know, successful and all that. So, Sheikh Sahib, give me some ayat or taweez or this and that. No. All these books, wherever you'll find that the Sahaba, whenever they put the question to Rasulullah it wasn't about the dunya. Because they put, they put their trust in Allah SWT, and there's a hadith of Rasulullah Wasallam. Make a note of this very, very important hadith, which is in Sunan al Tirmidhi, where Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has promised that if a man keeps himself busy, man or a woman, in learning the deen and teaching the deen, and he is so much into it, he is so much into it, that he is not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raising his hands about his own personal needs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making the angels witnessing his statement of Allah and saying, you be my witness that I will give this man more than the one who is asking me of his needs. So it is very clear to the Sahaba that if the Sahaba are busy in deen, if the Sahaba are busy in the deen, they don't have to be worried about the dunya because dunya will be under their feet. And there are quite plenty of verses in the Quran that if somebody only looks for the deen, Allah gives him deen and dunya. And somebody who is looking for the dunya, Allah gives him only dunya. If you ask Allah about dunya, Allah will give you dunya. But you won't get deen. Allah is saying, if you ask only about the deen, I will give you deen and dunya. There are plenty of verses in the Quran. And this hadith also confirms, and the previous hadith, the questions were all about 
deen. Questions were all about akhirah. Questions were all about success in this life and the hereafter. And this man, he came from jungle just to learn what is Islam. He didn't come to, you know, ask for the dunya. He didn't come to, you know, ask Rasulullah to make dua so that his, you know, gardens and his fields become, you know, uh, fully equipped with the wealth and all those kinds of prosperity. No. So this is very important for all of you because most of you are maybe, maybe struggling to get the job. And that could be one of your reasons for not attending this study circles or not becoming, you know, devoted to the deen because you are thinking, paid bhi to hai, isko bhi to dekhna hai, bachon ko bhi paalna hai, all these things. The people, they make lots of, you know, excuses and they say, we, you know, if you are talking about namaz and all, uh, only namaz, 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 so even looking after the children is also far. So we don't have enough time. If we, if you, if we go only for the ibadah, we will not be able to work and we won't be able to get, you know, the food or meal for a day. This is how people make excuses. And that's the reason I told you this hadith, that keep note of this hadith, that Rasul is saying that Allah promises that the one who is busy in my deen, the one who is busy in my deen, and he forgets to ask Allah SWT of his own needs, Allah gives him more than the one who is always asking about his needs. And one more hadith of Rasul Sallallahu That Rasul Sallallahu has said, the one who keeps himself busy with the deen, and he earns and gives in the deen, he makes the wealth, but he is spending in the deen. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying to Hadith Qudsi, he is saying that if you are worshipping me, I will give you deen and dunya. And if you are not worshipping me, I will keep you busy in the dunya and you will never be satisfied. I repeat again, Rasul is saying that Allah in Hadith Qudsi is saying, if you keep yourself busy in my ibadah, means in the deen, Allah will give you so much that it, you will be content with it. And it will never be, you know, you will never struggle with the dunya. But if you are running after the dunya, Allah will give you dunya, but you will never be content with it. You will still be struggling for that. Okay, so based on this point that the Sahabi came from the jungle and he didn't ask for the dunya, he only asked, Ya Rasulullah, I am a Muslim. But what is, who is the Muslim? What is Islam? Just tell me about Islam so that I can complete my Islam and I can be a true Muslim. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him that you have to pray five times in day and night. You have to pray five times in day and night. So the man asked him, Hal alayya ghayruha? Do I have to pray other than these five prayers? Then Rasul Sallallahu has used the word illa an tatawwa. If you want, if you want to pray more than the five daily prayers, then you can. But all you need is that what is required of you by Allah is to pray your five daily prayers, which means make a note of this. And this is very clear. All you have to do is you have to pray two rakat of fajr, four rakat of zuhr, four rakat of asr, three rakat of maghrib, and four rakat of isha. The sunnas. The 12 sunnahs, regular Salatul Muqadda, Sunnatul Muqadda, in one hadith it is 12 rakat and in another hadith is 8, 10 rakat. This is Sunnatul Muqadda. Including this, Witr, including this, all those other nawafil, they all are not requirement of your Islam when it comes to the pillars of Salah, pillars of Islam. Are you with me?
I make it very clear to you. The sunnahs which are regular sunnahs, sunnah al muqaddah and the nawafil before and after some prayers, and your witr, all these are counted as tatawwa. They are not fault. Otherwise, you are contradicting with this hadith. And if you are having any minor doubt about a person who is not praying his sunnahs, then you should be worried about this sahabi. Because this sahabi is asking Rasul And Rasul is also understanding about this man's curie. And at that time he didn't say that no, you still you have to pray with her. Or you still have to pray the two sunnahs of the fajr. No, he gave him a complete choice that if you want to pray any sunnahs or nafil of your own choice, of your own ease, you can. From Islam, from Allah, all is needed from, from you is two rakat of fajr which is fard, four rakat of zuhr which is fard, four rakat of asr which is fard, three rakat of maghrib which is fard, and four rakat of isha which is fard. So if you don't pray the witr, uh, 17 rakat, yes. So if you don't pray the witr, it is not a sin but you will get a blessing. If you pray. If you pray you get the reward but if you don't pray you won't be sinful. Okay. Yes, same thing. Surat al the same thing. Okay, now, so what's the point of, you know, emphasizing more on the sunnah? What's the point of, there are so many ahadith, if I give you only one, you know, subject on the merits and virtues of sunnah prayers and nafil prayers, it will take khutbahs, not khutbah, one khutbah, but it will take khutbah. Because there are merits and virtues of the two sunnahs, not of this regular sunnahs. Even this, after sunrise, before the mid midday, there are sunnahs which are highly rewarded. There are sunnahs, if you pray after, you know, the, your Zohar prayers. Sir, if, if you pray, why, why is it that if you pray the two sunnah rakats before the Fajr prayer, why is it so important? than the other Nafil prayers. Because of the merits and virtues, what the scholars have said, that because Prophet Sassam said that those, a person who has prayed two rakat sunnahs before the Fajr, he has cubed everything that is there in the whole dunya. Okay, so based on this, and also we know that what is important, the fard or the sunnah? Fard. To get ready for the fard, Especially at the time when you are half asleep and half you are tired and this and that. And at that time if you are not prepared for the fourth prayer, then you won't get any reward for that. So prepare yourself for the fourth prayer, that's why the sunnah has come before that. So that if you have prayed sunnah, then you will be still ready to pray your fourth. That's why the fajr sunnah is important than the other sunnahs. Because other sunnahs you are already awake. You are already active, your body is in a mood to do all the actions. But Fajr and Isha, these two prayers are the time when you are always looking for, you know, to rest yourself. And you want to sleep, you want to take, you know, uh, you want to give body rest. So at that time if you pray, definitely the reward will be more because that time it is hard to pray. And you as a believer you are praying. So you get more reward for that. So that's the only reason. Okay, the importance, I'll tell you one important thing about this sunnah prayers, why it should be prayed. We are not saying that don't pray at all or neglect it because this hadith says you don't need it. The reason is that on the day of judgment, hadith in Musnad Imam Ahmad Rasulullah has said that the first thing that Allah will ask and take the account of the person's deed will be about his prayers. And if he is successful in the prayers, he will be successful in all other questions. But if he is stuck with this, he will be in trouble. So <coughs> Rasul is saying that the first thing that Allah will ask the believer on the Day of Judgment will be about his prayer. And the time when the angel will be recording 
Okay, how many first prayers Abdul Majid prayed? How many Zohar prayed? How many Rakat? How did he pray? Whether he, it was prayed on time, whether he overslept, whether he did Qadha. Finally, the result came that Abdul Majid is getting, you know, only 30 marks, not 33 marks to pass. So he's failed. What should I do? The angel will ask Allah. Allah will say, have mercy upon Abdul Majid. He is normally traveling once a week from Luton to Aero. So have mercy upon him. He must have prayed some sunnahs or nothing. So add to his account. And finally the angel is saying he got 33 marks. Push him away. Push him in. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that's the benefit of our sunnahs in the field. Are you with me? Yeah. Interesting? Yes. Alhamdulillah. So that's the reason you should be praying the at least sunnatul muqaddah. Alhamdulillah. Next point. So this hadith confirms according to the uh, our subject that salat is the part of Islam. Now, very important point. What is the ruling of somebody who does not pray then? Kafir? Not obeying the Somebody is full of his neglected or some abandoned completely when probably he is from the Kufa. Okay, so the, there are scholars who say a person who is not praying, he is kafir. Man taraka salatan muta'amidan faqad kafar. Hadith. In Sunan, the Rasulullah has said, anybody who deliberately abandons the prayer, he is kafir. Faqad kafir, he has committed the act of disbelief. Another hadith in Sahih Muslim, he says that the difference between a believer and a disbeliever is salah. The fossil, fossil bain al Muslim wal mu'min wal kafir as salah. That uh, the difference between a believer and a non-believer is only a salah. That means to identify whether he is Muslim or a kafir, you have to see whether he prays or not. If he is praying, he is Muslim. If he is not praying, then he is kafir. Based on this, the scholars are uh, emphasized very strongly. And they said that a person who is not praying, he is kafir. And if he is married or she is married, to a Muslim couple or spouse, then one of them, if becomes kafir, then the marriage is invalid. And if they have the relationship, it will be counted as zina. And if the child is born through that process, then the child will be illegitimate child. And if this person dies, Muslim should not give him shouts and should not give him ghusl. And if he dies in this status, he should not be buried in the Muslim graveyard and he should not be prayed janazah for him. If after marriage, both the couple, are, they, are, they are praying, right? If after marriage, let's say the, the wife leaves and she doesn't pray or do anything, what happens to the husband's prayers? See, it's not the... There is no problem with husband's prayer. He is praying, he is praying. But the wife is not a Muslim then, if she is not praying. This is the first opinion. Second opinion, uh, which Imam Ibn Qayyim and also Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and some of the scholars even today, Some of the scholars today, they have confirmed that if a person is lazy and careless, then you can't consider him as kafir, but he will be punished in the hell. He will be punished in the hell, but you can't declare him as a kafir, kafir that has gone out of the fold of Islam. But this person definitely, he will be put into the hell and he will be put into a very serious uh, punishment and very serious and a dirty place in the hell. In Surah uh, An-Nur, in Surah An-Nur, Allah SWT has said, فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّةً That 
There will be some people who will come afterwards. Allah will salat. They have abandoned or they have wasted or they have, you know, been careless about their prayers. So their prayers were there but they were, you know, rewardless. وَالتَّبِعُوا shahawat, And they were followers of the desires, lust and desires. فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّا These people will meet غَيَّا According to the tafsir of Abdullah bin Abbas غَيَّا is a place in the Jahannam. It is like a container or a valley in the Jahannam which will have the water collected in it, liquid. This liquid will be urine, purse and blood of the people who will be punished in the Jahannam. And this person will meet that Ghayya just because he has wasted his prayers. And if you read Surah Al-Ma'oon, even in Surah Al-Ma'oon, which is in the last part of the Quran, Allah speaks about the believers, but these believers are believers, but they are bad believers. It says, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاؤُونَ وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Curse be upon those who are praying. So here it refers to this ayah and it is the translation or explanation of the hadith that Allah will punish the people even though they are praying. Even though they are praying. So that's why Allah is saying وَيْلُونَ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Allah is not saying وَيْلُونَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ وَيْلُونَ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَيْلُونَ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Curse be upon those who are praying. الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاؤُونَ That these people are praying, not for the sake of Allah, but for showing off. وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ And when it comes to the human rights, they are not fulfilling the human rights. They are, if somebody has to be paid, they don't pay on time. If somebody has to be, you know, if they have borrowed the loan and promised, they don't fulfill that. And if they have got some promises to be made, they don't fulfill those promises and they make lots of, you know, hard time and they do wrong to the human rights. And when it comes to Yamna'oon al Ma'oon, they are becoming the barriers for the charity work. Wa Yamna'oon al Ma'oon, there are people who are in need and they are stopping them to help these needy people. But the ayah says, Wailul Nim. Muslim, the people who are praying. So they are seriously warned in the Quran that they will be punished in the hellfire and still they, Allah is declaring them as what? The people who are praying. So here it refers to what? That they are people who are careless about their prayers. They were not perfect for prayer, people who are praying. So Allah will punish them. Another verse which is in Surah Al- مدسر كل نفس بما كسبت رهينة إلا أصحاب اليمين في جنات يتساءلون عن المجرمين ما سلككم في سقى قالوا لم نكن من المصلين ولم نكن نطعم المسكين وكنا نخوض مع القائضين وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين حتى أتانا اليقين فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ There are four sins. Okay, make the note of that. Very, very important part of our hadith. This is how you learn tafsir of each and every part of the hadith. In Surah Al-Muddassir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that everybody, when they will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their soul will be captured with Allah. They have to be released on bail. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ رَهِينَ إِلَّا أَصْحَابُ الْيَمِينَ Yes, except the soul of those people who will be on the right side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
فين جنات يتساءلون عن المجرمين they will be put in the jannah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that in the jannah they will be asking about the mujrimeen not about the kafir remember this word في جنات يتساءلون عن المجرمين in the jannah they will ask about the people that they know and according to Allah they were mujrimeen so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away the curtain which will be in between the people of the Jannah and in the people of the Jahannam there will be a wall that will be made as a transparent wall for them like sometimes when you go and visit your prisoners in the prison there is a wall between a mirror or a glass which is transparent you can see each other and you can even talk to each other but one is on the outside the prison and the other one is inside the prison so the same thing same situation will be there in the jannah that when they will the people of the jannah will ask about the people of the jahannam mujrimin or the people that they knew in the world allah will remove that barrier and they will be transparent to each other and they will ask ma salakakum fi saqar saqar is one of the name of the jahannam saqar is one of the name of the jahannam Jannah has got different names. One of the name is Sakar. So these people of the Jannah will ask them, "Ma salaka kumfi Sakar? What have you brought the, to you to Sakar? What actions? What what were you doing? Why you are in the Sakar?" So listen to the answer. People in the Jahannam, they are mujrimin, they are not kafir, and they are approaching and talking to the Muslims in the Jannah. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying that they are giving the answer. First answer was لم نكن من المصلين. Second was ولم نكن نطعم المسكين. Third وكنا نخوض مع الخائضين. Fourth وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين حتى أتانا اليقين. فما تنفعهم شفاعة الشافعين. لم نكن من المصلين. We were not as good as those people who were praying. We were not amongst those who were praying. Yes. Wala na ko not ramal miskin, and we were not helping the needy people. We were not feeding those people who were in need, and we are, as most of us practicing brothers and sisters. We have got very soft corners when we hear about the people suffering in Syria, people suffering in Nigeria, people suffering in any part of the world. But when it comes to our own relatives, our aunties, our uncles, our nieces, nephews, our orphans in our family, we ignore them. And they are more deserving people than those people to you who are in our homeland and we are enjoying and they are not so it is our first duty and this ayah you know includes these people too that we were not feeding the people who were in need and we were not feeding or for providing the food for the miskin and we were just wasting our time here and there playing games Sitting in the attics and playing games, we were just wasting our time, playing with the people, playing with this, playing with that, just enjoying the life, wasting our time. There's no importance of the time. Time is passing. I was playing when I was seven. I was playing when I was fifteen. I was playing when I was twenty-five. I was playing when I was thirty-five. I was playing when I was forty-five. I was playing when I was 65. I was playing when I was dying. <laughs> End of the story. Um, and you're saying, brother, that people that if you're coming from a different country, for example, they have rights upon you to feed them uh, is in terms of zakat. Is it a haq? First, you have to see your own people. First, yes. First, you have to see your own people. Prophet I'll tell you this again, inshallah, please remind me. Okay. Rasul uh, So this, the fourth one is, 
Now, wasting our time like playing football for no reason, playing cricket for no reason. Okay, for your fitness is all right. If you want to keep yourself fit for the deen, for your health, for your iman, for mashallah, for helping the family, looking after the family. Okay, this sometimes you can play. Sometimes like wrestling is good. You can go for wrestling. Swimming is good, yes, you can go for swimming, but they, it has got all reasons for what? To keep yourself fit for, if it is needed for the deen, for the uh, jihad, for Islam, okay? Or for your self-defense. So, arrow shooting is part of sunnah, horse riding is part of sunnah. These are the games which will help you. But sitting in front of the computers and playing games which will stress your eyes, stress your mind, and stress your body and you are good for nothing. As somebody asks you to play sometimes once in a while, then you are <laughs> struggling. Maybe if somebody won't stop you, you might have heart attacks. <laughs> so people will have mercy on you. So if a, if a Muslim uh, is a professional cricketer or a footballer, he cannot, he cannot uh, uh, follow that career, can he? Why not? But you, you're just saying that... Uh, I'm saying wasting of time. If somebody is earning and making his halal living by that, and at the same time is fully fooling Islamic right, what do you think, I'm not going in the gym? I'm not <laughs> no, a sportsman? I'm, I'm, speaking of career, I'm speaking of a career, not as a... No, no, career is okay. But it's not 24 7 in that. But I have seen so many Pakistani football cricket players in Dubai when I was 15, 16 years old. I used to see them in the stadium. At the time of the Salah, they would deliver, even leave the game and they would go and pray their prayers. And these are the Muslim, Muslim uh, you know, cricketers which I have known. The Muslim cricketers in the uh, Indian team, Muslim cricketers in Pakistani team. I know them in person, so we can't give a fatwa directly saying that. But I'm saying, wasting of time. People, they don't pray and they are on TV. Yeah. People, they don't pray, they are busy with, you know, like uh, uh, June 14. The first match is between England and... Then you will say, ah, see, you will have that record. So the people are, I'm talking about those kind of people. No, yeah, that's okay in Dubai, but I have seen here Pakistan playing England on a Friday and they are all in the field. Okay, they are wrong. They are wrong. It's not an excuse for them. I agree with you. Okay, so then the fourth excuse is, sorry, <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a very important point over here. People they say, somebody who says I do not believe in the Tiyama is kafir. Sometimes we by our actions, even though we don't say that with the words, but because of our actions we may fall into this ayah. We were denying the day of judgment. And the scholars have given plenty of explanations. One of the explanations of this ayah, this last part, that denying of the day of judgment is that you do something heedlessly. You do certain things heedlessly. You don't care for what you're doing. You may abuse somebody and you say, come on, I don't care. You shout and fight with somebody, you say, I don't care. You beat somebody, you do wrong to somebody and you say, I don't care. So this is as good as you don't care that one day you will be standing in front of Allah. There is a day of judgment. You don't care now, but there is someone who will be caring for what you are doing. And doing that action heedlessly is one of those who are denying the day of judgment. Or sometimes... Sometimes when we are fighting and arguing with somebody and saying, don't say this, don't do like this, Allah will ask you on the day of judgment. Why don't you remember that one day you will be standing? Oh, who cares for that? I don't mind Allah put me in the jahannam. People, they say, I don't mind if Allah puts me in the jahannam. Okay, you go to jannah. Allah made jannah for you. You go, go. We'll see. If I have to go to jahannam, I don't mind. In one of the Juma khutbahs, I delivered Juma khutbah in Dubai. After the Juma, I came out, a young chap, bodybuilder, full, you know, biceps and triceps and shape and this chest and six packs and all that. 
I, he caught my head and he said, Sheikh Sahib, you were very angry. You were saying that people will go to Jahannam and all that. Sheikh Sahib, Allah has made Jahannam for real people. You know, if, 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 there are no, you, if there are no people of our kind existing in the world, then what's the use of making Jahannam? So Allah has made Jahannam for us. And he was so upset with my khutbah, he said, Sheikh Sahib, this khutbah should be given to the kuffar. We all are Muslims, we don't need your Jumma khutbah. What are you going to say about this? Wallahi, I thought I'll, his, all this beautiful shape and beautiful body is nothing in front of my one punch. I could have knocked him out in one punch. But I told him, SubhanAllah, look, fear Allah. Fear Allah. Don't impress by all these kind of things. You are nothing. You are nothing, alhamdulillah. The power is the power of Iman. So what I'm saying is, subhanAllah, there are people of this kind. You don't have to say that I don't believe in the Qiyamah. Your action itself can prove whether you really think of that or not. You're really worried of that or not. Why? Because Prophet said, eyes are committing zina. And zina of eyes are looking at the naked women or haram things. Ears commit zina, tongue commit zina. And listening some haram things, speaking some haram things. And then Prophet has said, your private part confirms it. So all these kind of things, you don't have to say that you do this or that. Some of your actions done heedlessly proves that whether you believe in the Qiyamah or not. So coming back to the points, there are four points mentioned in the ayah. We were not amongst those who were praying. We were not among those who were helping the people of the need. We were wasting our time and we were denying the Day of Judgment. And these kind of things which we, we were doing, all these four things, not for one day or two days, or not for today and yesterday we didn't do, or tomorrow we won't do. Hatta atan al yaqeen. We were in these four sins till our death. One of the name of the death is yaqeen. Make a note of that. One of the name of the death is yaqeen. Hatta atan al yaqeen. We were in this situation. لم نكن من المصلين ولم نكن نطعم المسكين وكنا نخذ مع القائلين وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين حتى أتانا اليقين till we have faced the death فما تنفعهم شفاعة الشافعين Here the verse is very very seriously ended with this conclusion that these people who have died with these four sins فما تنفعهم شفاعة الشافعين any peer sahab, any wali sahab, any buzurg, any imam, any jinn, any malaika, any prophet or messenger, even prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa anybody who will intercede on the behalf of these people, Allah will not stop them from intercede, uh, interceding on their behalf. They will be given the permission. But Allah is saying, فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَفَعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ The intercession of the people who will intercede on their behalf will not benefit them means it will not be accepted on their behalf. So, one of them is that people will not pray. So this one, when we talk about Arkanul Islam, that we have to be serious about the prayers. But, we have to be perfect in the five first prayers. And the Nafil prayers will be added to our shortcomings, if we have anything small point on prayer which I want to check. Now, some people pray Isha and then they pray Vikr. Can you pray Tahajjat uh, when you get up before Fajr then? Because I was told that if you pray Vikr, the next one is Fajr and not, you can't pray Tahajjat. No, so, what is the opinion on that? You, you can pray any prayer you want. Inshallah. You mean after? But you can pray with her only one with her. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But yeah. after with her, if you want to still pray something, yeah, you can you, pray. If I want to pray tahajjud before Fajr, when I get up? Yes, you can. Can I pray? You can, you can. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Then, Jiban. Out of four sins, the first thing you said uh, that uh, they were not as good as those people who were praying. That means they were praying. That's the reason all these ayat which I quoted to you, it's the, the lead for those people who say 
that if a person is abandoning the prayers because of his laziness and carelessness, he is still a believer, he will be punished, but he will not be punished as the kuffar will be punished forever. He will be mujrimin. Yes, they will be mujrimin. They will not be kafir. Yes. You know, sometimes when you pray, you think all the things. You About the woman? <laughs> Are you married? Come on, boy, get married, man. You think of other stuff, for example. If you think of your wife, Allah will forgive you, Inshallah. Don't worry. Leave other stuff, for example, you know, when you come rushing from you know, university, you're thinking about work. So, what's the condition of the prayer? What's the salah? Your salah is actually, you know, it depends upon the percentage that you have devoted to Allah's, you know, ibadah. There is a hadith of.